Okay, so, uh, hi, I'm Phil Catney. Um, I'm a lecturer in politics at Keele University. Uh, it's the 8th of May, uh, it's the morning after the night before, uh, and the results are mostly in now. Um, so it's probably time we can start to make some judgments about what's been happening, uh, particularly last night, which was a pretty exciting election as they go. What's the latest that you've heard? How you, how the Conservatives have four short of the majority. Uh, there are still 13 to to be declared, so they're pretty certain to get there and go over the line now and have a, at least a very bare majority government. The polls before the election seem to be forecasting it was going to be very close. Yeah. What went wrong? We don't know yet. <laughs> that's the problem. Um, polls, the, the kind of polling that's done is uh, trying to ask people how they think they might vote, not how they have voted. Uh, and some of the exit polls that came out at 10 o'clock last night were extremely accurate. Uh, there were a lot of questions over uh, the accuracy of them at the time. But as the night went on, uh, those qualms quickly faded uh, and uh, in his polling. Uh, so the polls, there are a couple of ways, a couple of facts that may explain this. One is that it may be the sort of spiral of silence, we call it, where Conservative voters are reluctant to admit to voting Conservative. However, that doesn't explain how the exit poll was so accurate, because if they're reluctant to say before the election, uh, surely they would be after the election. So that, that may be one factor people cite, but we don't know whether that actually is the factor. Uh, another one might be uh, just the complexities and messiness of the actual party contests at the local level, that like there were so many uh, three-way contest votes getting taken off one to another that the results came out slightly different at a constituency level. Uh, so we're going to have to look at how we do our uh, polling in future, how this works. Um, certainly many of the, I was looking through some of the initial uh, predictions that experts were making at the start of the campaign, uh, nobody predicted the, the Conservatives to be over 300 seats. Okay. And nobody predicted Labour to be under 250. Uh, so there is a, a no, and only a couple thought that the Dumpers might get wiped out as badly as they did do. Uh, and even then, they overestimated <laughs> that. So it's, it, it really is, um, polling and uh, election punditry is more an art than a science in some, in, in some respects. Absolutely. And a lot of it is very hard to uh, say with any degree of certainty because you're dealing with few people change their minds or don't tell you the truth. Absolutely. It was a big night for the SNP which probably had a major effect on the, on the Labour. Uh, Labour's collapse. Uh, we saw up to 39% swings against Labour for the SNP in, in a couple of seats. Uh, that, is, that is shocking. We, at Blair's um, landslide election in 1997, you were looking at 10% swings and that was considered to be extraordinary. Um, the last election I was uh, commentating live uh, and when um, East Belfast went against Peter Robinson and that was a 21% swing. We went, wow! Uh, Labour, you're just watching the swingometer literally breaking because it wasn't far enough, it didn't actually cope with this. Something seismic happened north of the border. Um, Labour has had a, a lot of problems, they've had five leaders in seven years. Uh, it's, it's, it's not been a well run party north of the border for a, a while. Um, but also, it's the way in which they manage the politics of, with London. Uh, the Welsh Labour Party managed to insulate itself a little bit more from the, uh, from the, pro the same problem the Scottish had because the Welsh Labour Party managed to define itself, it, it has done since the, nearly the start of devolution, the as separate from the London Labour Party, whereas the Scottish one didn't. Uh, and certainly the resignation of the uh, Labour leader, Scottish Labour leader earlier. So one of the key issues that the election results are going to throw up is the um, extent to which we need to start looking at our constitutional system and the way in which we govern elections and the state itself is run. Uh, so at the election level, clearly the disproportionality that was emerged and yet again from the first past the post system has already created demands from UKIP um, um, in, in, to, to start looking at Douglas Cargill and Clacton that we need to start looking at how we deal with this because three and a half million people, the latest tally suggests, voted UKIP and got one representative in the, in, in the House of Commons. This, uh, similarly, um, the Green Party had one and a half million people nationally voting for them with one representative elected. Um, people feel disenfranchised if this continues. But the question, but Conservatives may well feel that they have, as has typically happened in the 20th century, whenever we de debated changing the electoral system, the party in power generally doesn't want to change it because they got into power through that system uh, and don't want to potentially lose that base of power for the future. 
The second issue is the actual nature of the state itself. Um, we were talking about the, uh, the Scottish issue and what has been floating uh, in the last few hours is the issue of federation and a federal state and actually properly nailing down a balance between Scotland, uh, England, uh, Wales and maybe Northern Ireland. But get that constitutional framework sorted because we've been having a very incremental um, uh, stop-start devolution process. Um, and whilst in the early days it seems to have uh, held back uh, independence calls, um, it may seem to be slightly less effective, although we perhaps do need to be careful that an SNP vote does not mean a vote for independence. Okay, that's, that's the other caveat. The, the SNP have been very savvy in linking their electoral calls, their electoral uh, position to Scotland's um, position negotiating with Westminster, not necessarily about independence. So we have to be slightly careful about this. But certainly uh, some Conservatives we've been talking about sorting out a more stable framework because David Cameron doesn't want to be the last Prime Minister of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So we have to start thinking about uh, potentially how we do this. Uh, and again, we've, we've done bits of this, this thinking in the past, but we haven't really been sincere in seeing it through and thinking and debating it properly. Um, the debate about the AV referendum was frank, frankly depressing when we had it. The, the quality of debate was was terrible, frankly. Um, and so we, we do need to go back and talk about some of these issues. I, I teach these, I teach, we discuss these, we teach these issues in my British policy classes, my politics classes, and students are introduced to talk about these issues there. Unfortunately, people outside universities don't necessarily feel the same enthusiasm for debating uh, the nature of electoral rules, the way we calculate votes into seats. But we see it in election results like today, how that starts to create um, very strange results which um, in a democracy we perhaps need to think about much more uh, in a much more hard and clear-headed way. The majority seemed that it was going to be still quite slender. Mm. How stable can the government be with, with that sort of uh, level? Uh, it's difficult. Um, the, the, the common imagery is the Callaghan years or even the major years um, where they had to rely upon also unionist votes to try and um, secure the government for a few for a few months longer. Um, not that in both cases it ultimately helped them win the the, the following election. Um, but we are looking at a, a situation where Cameron has a very very tight majority. Uh, and one thing we do know, looking at recent parliaments, is that backbenchers are becoming more rebellious, not less rebellious. So he's got a, a task on his hand, potentially keeping uh, a majority there. In one sense having a coalition with the Liberal Democrats gave him quite a significantly large majority. He could absorb some rebellious behaviour. Uh, there's no scope for that now. So in one sense, party management is actually going to be quite difficult for, for Cameron. Um, ultimately, as the Parliament goes on, um, he will pr probably lose by-elections, uh, as parties tend to do in government, uh, and his uh, majority slim may well be nothing uh, in the not-too-distant future. And at that point, he may well have to start thinking about deals with the, the Democratic Unionist Party, who are sort of conservative, but uh, well, they are conservative, but they have sort of similar stances on the economy and welfare reform as the Conservative Party. So he may well do a deal with them, uh, but that's not necessarily unproblematic because, the Ulster, because involving yourself with Ulster politics invariably uh, has potential blowback um, in terms of um, reputation management. So. There's a, a there's a problem there which may, uh, which um, Cameron has to deal with in the long term. He may well end up with a major situation where Major was very popular after the 92 election with the Conservatives. He won a, an unlikely election, uh, and then they crucified him <laughs> before the end of that Parliament. So we'll see how it goes. David Cameron may well uh, be grateful that he's already given himself the out by the end of this by the end of this uh, Parliament uh, because he may well wing it. Absolutely. I, I know there's no crystal ball and you can't look into the future. But your thoughts about higher education, for example, in the, over the next five years? It's going to be difficult. Clearly, the Conservatives had um, plans to introduce things like a teaching audit uh, and do uh, various other things, uh, various other proposals for universities. Um, and they might be able to push a lot of these more radical, not just to higher education, but other radical agendas through if they can get bipartisan accord on this, if they can't get a very disciplined majority in the House. But as I said, there, there's people at the part of the Democratic Unionists who may well uh, lend their votes uh, for a price. <laughs> so um, so the, the, there's a sense in which uh, policy, 
Dali Alexander was saying last night, you think you, um, you so uh, this morning, you uh, you think you've seen the Tories, uh, which you see them in full blood without us restraining them. Uh, and and so cons there's, there's a lot of Conservatives who may have high expectations that they can do quite radical things. But they don't necessarily have the majority to do very radical things. And certainly if they can't carry every one of their backbenchers or get some support from the other side, they may well lose these votes. So it'll be interesting to see whether there is a degree of the policy radicalism that certainly the Conservatives seem to suggest they would like. Um, and the, the, the mandate, whilst it's there, um, is not so robust that the Conservatives could necessarily claim a full-throated uh, endorsement from the British population. So um, it will be interesting to see how policy develops, and this is my other research interest, how policy making develops the next few years, um, because the Conservatives will in one sense, we'll have quite a uh, difficult parliamentary arithmetic to deal with on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. The, the, the media always play a major part in, in, in the elections and, to some extent, the, the, the outcomes. Mm. How much were they responsible for perhaps fogging the issue this time, causing that confusion? Um, th I think the media coverage hasn't been bad, actually, in this election. It's, it's very fashionable to beat up on the media and say it's dumbing down and it's, it's getting poorer. Um, th there actually has been significant amount of coverage this election um, through BBC, online. Um, th I don't think I've seen a more covered ele election based on issues as well. There has been a significant degree of talking about policy, um, more so than I actually thought there might be. So I'm, I was pleasantly surprised. I, I was dreading it would be another, and there was a very corporately managed element, there was a very media, media management uh, eye on a lot of the campaigns. That was very clear. But the discussion about policy was not bad. The, the leaders' debates were, of course, a bit um, phony in parts, and they were a bit um, polemical, and uh, uh, there was a lot of hyperbole going around, but that's what you expect. But around that, I think there was actually quite a lot of discussion. The one thing which there will be a lot of consideration now is the deficit and how we deal with the deficit. Uh, because clearly there is going to be some very tough medicine to swallow in this parliament. Um, and the Conservatives are going to have to be the people who administer it. Uh, now, how they can get that through uh, and what support they get. Labour did sign up to deficit reduction as well. Um, can they cut deals with, can, can they get support from Labour? Will the next leader of the Labour Party, assuming Ed Miliband falls on his so sword, um, will they be willing to play ball with the deficit reduction uh, plans and will they help the Conservatives out? I, I'm not sure they will. But again, we have to explore these possibilities in the next the next few weeks and months ahead. Uh, we, we've seen a lot of big names either lose the seat or, or possibly expecting to resign. How will the, the other parties regroup and, and, and go forward now? I mean, they've been on annihilation. Well, the Democrats are in a very bad sh shape. I mean, uh, they're, they're clearly shocked by the level of um, uh, annihilation that's taken place in this election. They have been very ba badly battered and bruised. Nick Clegg will. Um, the problem for Nick Clegg is there are not many people left in the parliamentary Liberal Democrat Party now to take up the mantle of leadership and think about how to reform it. Uh, th there's been lots of talk from Lynn Campbell and others saying we'll build from the ground up, we've had scorched earth before, we can do this. Um, in one night they've been set back a long way. Okay? Uh, general election of general election of work at the grassroots level to build this base support seems to have evaporated. Um, overnight, or at least it's been happening since the coalition started. Um, so this is uh, this is a big issue for them. Labour as well has a problem. How do they position themselves uh, in this new complex dynamic of British politics and how you position yourself with nationalists being able, well, at least in Scotland and Wales, Plaid Cymru are actually quite poor in their performance. Um, how do you position yourself on issues? How do you deal with um, a Liberal Democrat Party, which may well move further back to the left uh, on their issues if the new leader the new leader takes over because the Liberal Democrats have been moving around the political spectrum a bit, uh, with depending on the leader. Um, where do they? How does how does Labour rebuild itself in in relation to the other policy positions being adopted by other parties? So, it's um, it's going to be interesting times. We don't really know what the party's going to do apart from, uh, I think uh, one Labour, um, I think it was Lord Falconer said, uh, our policies are probably going to be the same policies for the next time round. We can't. You know, Labour Party will seek to try and uh, raise the minimum wage. The Labour Party will seek to try and end zero-hour contracts in the future. That does, I think those are fairly well-agreed policies within the party. It will be partly about presentation and make sure they get a leader who actually resonates with the population more than 
Eddie Miliband seemed to in this election. Mm. SNP now seem unassailable in Scotland, of course. Yeah, well, one one party states come or one party states go. It, it, it's it, we don't know what's going to happen. It certainly looks very very bad for Labour. The swings were enormous. Um, the, the, the bruising of Scottish Labour is very, very, uh, is very, very hard. Uh, so they're going to have to think about what they, uh, how they respond to this. But certainly the SNP uh, have got a very good foothold in Scotland. They've been building it now for a while, um, and, and and a lot of things are coming up from um, latent, re um, um, latent um, resentment of the Blair years and and Scotland's treatment in the Iraq War. A lot of things which, or a couple of elections ago, seem to be bubbling up again. Um, so there's lots of things which Labour are going to have to try and deal with. The legacy of new Labour, um, the problems of dealing with a very, very uh, well, um, uh, dealing with a party in the SNP that seems to be very well organised, seems to be very coherent in their message um, and seem to get a lot of resonance on the, on the doorsteps in Scotland. How does Labour deal with this? A nationalist force. Nationalism is very hard to shift. Um, so we'll, we'll see how how much traction uh, SNP has, but certainly um, the opinion, the, 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 the polls um, from last night suggest that they have got a very, very strong position. But I suppose Labour's um, hope is it could only get better <laughs> north of the border um, because it has to. That it, Labour cannot really realistically govern without a significant number of Scottish seats and having the same number of seats as the, the Conservative Party north of the border is frankly shocking for them. It seems the Conservatives, as we mentioned earlier, have got that slim majority. Mm. How do you see the next five years? Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, it's going to, it, politics is going to be very much um, crisis management um, week by week. Uh, Harold Wolf famously said a week's a long time in politics. We're going to find that out yet again. Um, the cruise control approach to politics uh, is going to end, I think. Uh, and it's very dangerous to predict this. You may go fabulously smoothly. Uh, but I think it's going to be one of those um, situations where a government wins the election, uh, but is going to suffer <laughs> for winning it for the next few years in trying to manage it. Um, and the Conservatives are going to have to ha make sure their party whips are very, very effective.